Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in emerging technologies, digital assets, a regulatory landscape, and capital markets. This segment is presented by Charles Schwab. I'm your host, Jill Melandrino, and joining us this afternoon, we have Michael Anderson, Executive Vice President and Head of Enterprise Business at SoundHound AI, as well as Sean Desmond, President and CEO of NASDAQ Listed and Sino. We're here to discuss the future of emerging technologies in banking and across multiple industries and customer experience and how to make the most out of it to support business initiatives. It is great to have both of you with us. Welcome to Trade Talks. And it's interesting, Sean, we're at a point now where we're understanding what these AI tools are able to do for the businesses, not just about AI, the technology itself. Yeah, for sure. And it's a fascinating time. And thank you for having um, me as well as Michael. We appreciate being here on behalf of Encino. And for us, AI come, comes up in every customer conversation. Right. Um, and it's the dominant talk track in the industry, but specific to our needs. And in order for us to meet the moment and have a competitive advantage, um, our financial institutions, that's our customer base, banks and credit unions and IMBs. They have to be prepared to incorporate AI into their financial products, into their operational workflows and their daily banking activities. We focus on the outcomes, not necessarily just the proxy to get there, which happens to be AI. Um, so what's the best outcome can we that we can serve up to our customers in the context of whether that's credit risk, productivity, efficiency, and the key to getting most out of an AI tool or strategy will continue to be the data and arming yourself with the right data, knowing how to make the best use of that for your initiatives. And that's what we're focused on here at Encino. Yeah. And Michael, I'll ask you the question in a different way, but also understanding what type of AI is going to best serve your customer and the problems that you're looking to solve for them? Yeah, happy to do so. And thanks for having me, Jill. And uh, Sean, pleasure to, to be on this with you. Um, when I first think about what matters, is you've got to distinguish between the different types of AI, especially around conversational AI. You think about things like um, deterministic, which is the legacy way of actually developing these solutions, where we've now moved to generative AI and agentic. Generative AI is a, a basic understanding of like, how do I fundamentally create content like texts, images, things that are code based that you would get traditionally from a chat GPT versus where we're now moving into agentic AI, which is taking that ability to go to the next level. The, the ability for me to actually take actions and take in, back in integrations to systems that Sean's organization is actually doing as well, and making sure that we're leveraging that technology to, for, to bring forward the outcomes and the um, intents that these individuals are calling in for. Let me give you an example. If I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a consumer calling into a bank, instead of going into a retail bank where you traditionally would go in and actually um, set up an account, now I can call in. I can get authenticated as a new user. I can actually request a new bank account. I can move money over there. I can ask questions around the loan types they provide and the interest rates and how I actually would apply for that. All those things are very natural language processing and understanding, and I can do that in my own utterances in my own language, um, which is far better than actually getting up and going into a re retail bank today. Yeah. And, and Sean, not only is improving the, you know, the customer experience, but it's also helping to enhance, particularly on the financial services side, risk management and compliance as well. Absolutely. Um, and ultimately, we're looking to de-risk portfolios uh, for our customers and streamline regulatory compliance requirements on an ongoing basis. Um, so our banks and credit unions can use AI to manage credit risk more efficiently. It's it's long been uh, very labor intensive for our customer base. And, and one approach that we have to risk and compliance issues is using that data, including historical loan performance, um, including borrower behavior, any sort of macro um, inputs with interest rates to keep up with regulatory and compliance requirements. So uh, while many uh, uh, FIs have this data, they're not able to necessarily harness it to its fullest extent. So for an example, uh, updating um, CECL requirements, expected credit loss requirements, requires our customers to estimate and provide to all expected credit losses on their own uh, on their loans and financial assets uh, at any point in time, at any snapshot. Um, so instead of waiting until there's evidence to show a borrower they're in trouble, they need to prove that. Um, and and data can support these forward-looking estimates and make modeling strategies much more reliable and minimize chances of any sort of regulatory uh, repercussions. And that's an example of AI at work with Encino. Yeah, and, and Michael, while it's transformative, 
um, these types of emerging technologies, it is going to change the way that work is done with automating tasks. And you have to upskill, reskill, understand your sources of control. And it really is going to transform how all of the business functions within an organization work. So not only is it transformative for the outcome or for risk modeling, it's going to be transformative for the workforce as well. It absolutely is going to be. And I think we're going to have to look at reskilling res individuals and, mm -hmm. and shaping the way that they actually go and get and start their career, but also those that are already out there in their career. And it's maybe a second opportunity for them to look at where they can drive value within these types of technologies. When I think about this as well, you need to build trust and control around it. So if, if you build these solutions, do you actually trust it and can control it in a manner that actually delivers the type of value you want out of the company that you're, you're supporting, especially in the banking industry? Um, the, the other two focus areas, though, is process and technology. When we think about process, there, these these um, processes are outdated, especially in the banking and financial institutions. We've got to look at those those processes. We've got to refactor those and make sure that they're rebuilt for AI and the ability for an AI type technology, especially on conversational AI, to actually reach in, make the changes that are going to happen or apply for that in consumer or even that business that's looking to make a loan or actually call in for specific things like wealth management. The other is for technology. The technology out there is legacy. Some of these do not have strong APIs. You need APIs that allow you to drive and interact with those backend systems that quite frankly are, are so legacy that they may need to be replaced or, or, or they need to be, uh, they're redundant. Um, so developing those solutions and allowing you to find a way to, to deliver that through conversation eyes is, is gonna be key to actually giving the right user experience that you wanna provide. Yeah. And Sean, you had brought up, you know, ethics, transparency and bias mitigation um, at the top of your answer. I think that is just as critical as the technology and the solutions that are being provided itself. It is. And listen, the technology is exciting and we're very proud of Banking Advisor, which is one of our generative AI powered solutions. Think of it as a co-pilot for bank employees that can draft credit memos or process financial documents. But if you can't do that um, in a compliant sort of a way, then then there's there's going to be questions on the other side, right? We can also free up time that bankers can spot risk factors that an algorithm might miss, right? So including concentration of risk in any one particular industry, a model risk caused by over-reliance on, uh, on, on credit models, any singular credit model. Um, so AI can be helpful in all these areas to reduce reputational risk and draw regulatory and, and, and the regulatory scrutiny that's on our customers. Yeah. And Michael, let's expand on that more as it relates to cybersecurity, because I think the way that organizations think about and evaluate their cybersecurity protocols, not only is it um, you know, a, a regulatory and compliance issue, but I think in the competitive landscape, particularly with emerging technologies as the attack services um, um, expand and so forth, reevaluating your incident response processes and controls are, are paramount in this environment. It is absolutely. And then you got to break it down by region, by by the type of uh, interaction you're having with the types of users. I mean, those attackers that are out there are always looking for ways to kind of break in, and they're trying to get that IP so they can actually use that against you. Um, so the cybersecurity measurements are going to be key to making sure that these solutions are adopted. It's not. It's beyond just the user experience, but adoption of making sure my data is secure. I feel good about using this and interacting with it, and knowing that it's going to be safe for me as a user, and I'm not going to be um, hacked or you know someone's going to go out there and start leveraging my assets to go benefit themselves. Yeah, I, I think that's such a great point, Mike. If I could jump in there, I mean, AI can only deliver value if people trust the AI, and and that trust comes from approaching and presenting AI responsibly with, with safeguards, with human oversight and a clear understanding of limits. Um, and once you have that trust, you can build transparency into the process as well, um, right? So for example, the same banking advisor experience I, re I referred to earlier can clearly identify when a piece of information is generated by AI and verify its accuracy with citations, which increases trust from our regulators. Yeah, well, Sean, let's expand on that for a moment here um, as we think about what these technologies are going to look like, let's even call it the next six months, year or three years as they're evolving so quickly. Are, are you concerned that the industry or just, you know, all industries rush to get internal and external products out there for the sake of saying that, you know, we have an AI tool and mechanism um, just to get the product out there? Do, do we know enough? Has, it been, has the risk been modeled enough or is it just still something that we're learning and figuring out? Yeah, well, it's probably a little bit of both is the honest answer, right? There's a lot of hyperbole out there and there is a lot of gratuitous reference to AI. 
Um, and for us at Encino, the most important thing is that we have a clearly defined and articulated strategy, and it anchors the outcomes uh, and the foundational data set that we have. So we think about um, a, a three-pronged strategy we have around banking advisor, agentic AI, and our integration gateway. How do we serve up generative value? How do we deliver agentic experiences? And how do we tap into the data set we have to mine those insights? Um, and, and I think that really does build that trust that we talked about versus just saying we're going to inject AI. What, what people really light up um, around our interactions, right? Because what's what we're doing is we're We've gone from a manual legacy experience into a digitally collaborative experience, and now digital collaboration is being reimagined through AI. So where can you identify the friction points and serve up agents where they make sense, but keep humans in the loop where they're needed? Yeah. I think so, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Interrupt just real quick. I think part of this is also understanding how do I design these? What's the qualification requirements that I'm looking for from that type of bank or regulatory um, company? I'm looking at those, then deciding, okay, after I design this, how am I going to build this in a way that's architected to actually allow me to deliver the right user experience, but also have those safeguards around security? And that's the other key thing around this is not only the, the voice component, but all the other channels you're going to be using. Think about SMS and texting and leveraging and making sure those things are, are secure because you're going through the te telephony system at that point. Um, so there's a lot of areas where you could have weakness and you just need to make sure that you have the right you know security in place to, to support it. Yeah. So, Michael, what I'm hearing from both you and Sean is that purposeful development is really what the key is here, because consumers, they're so sophisticated these days, they're going to be able to discern what is purposeful and what's well built and, you know, feeling secure within that environment. That's right. Yeah, I agree. And the models, to a certain degree, are commoditized and ever changing. Right. And, and questions about those models will persist. Um, and our perspective is it's not always so much about what model you're using is it the most impressive is it that have the most press but knowing which model to use for which problem to solve and and we've identified a growing number of of these um you know pain points for our customers and friction points and then you have to marry up not only the model but the data that you have and we've been standing on a foundation of 13 years of of trusted data and you tap into that and you and you have a one plus one equals three scenario yeah and Michael, it's interesting because I see in your notes here as you think about what emerging roles are going to look like within this environment, AI trainers, prompt engineers, human AI team specialists, which um, insinuates to me that the human in the loop is going to be, you know, that's going to continue. You're not going to see humans go away. It's just going to be reskilling or upskilling their resources. Yeah, I believe there's going to be, look, it's all about output. How much output can I provide with human capital, but also non-human capital, which is automation. And that could be the form of conversational or non-conversational automation, things that are triggering alerts. And I can take action against those because I'm supporting the infrastructure of a major bank's um, systems. Or it could be the fact that I'm supporting the front end consumer through just the them for uh, consumer slash banking. Um, when I think about the shift of skills, though, the shifts are going to be they're going to happen. They're going to come. And the, the, the colleges are going to have to adapt and evolve as well with this tech type of technology, which we're already seeing today. I was actually down at Florida State visiting, and I noticed that they have new education careers that they're coming out, and, and I think that's fantastic. And so how do I take that and actually apply that to the real world versus how we used to think in the past when we didn't have these digital solutions that could help us in the real world? Yeah. And, and it's really encouraging to hear because, you know, academia is such a big incubated ground for these types of technologies. And you are starting to hear about more public private partnerships in conjunctions with um, academia. I know the North Carolina Community College system, I believe there's 50, 58 schools within their community system, and they're teaming up with private um, enterprise as well to make sure that the right skills are being taught. Um, so it's, it's more of an effective loop all the way around. So let, let, let's Wrap this up here with Outlook for a moment here, Michael, when you think about what's next. So agentic AI is kind of where we are right now. What's beyond that? Yeah, so you know, there's we could always talk about a year or five years out. In my view is I believe everyone's going to have a, an agentic deterministic agent that's their concierge. So for instance, I get in the car and as I'm, the car is driving me now, which is obviously real. We never thought that was going to happen 10 years ago. As I go, I can say, these are the 10 things or 10 tasks I want to get done within the car today and let my agent go out there and do those things for me. Well, I'm focused on other things that are really focused on my pure business and the, the making sure I'm doing things that are 
probably not as much repeatable and they require some more human touch to them. That's where I think we're really going to go with this technology. And beyond that is the, the follow through. It's not just about making the request, but allowing these technologies to orchestrate against each other, communicate in a way that I get the best results for what I'm trying to do. Let me give you an example. I'm looking to, um, I'm trying to book a uh, an appointment for me to get healthcare, and I need to make sure that I go at this specific time in this window. And I have other times that I need to go because I need to be at this other place where it knows my calendar, can look at those make and make the right decisions that's best for me at that time versus having to, having a human sit there and try to you know set that up. Yeah, and Sean, I'll ask the same question of you as well as we wrap up here. Your outlook and what's beyond agentic AI. Yeah, what's fascinating to explore is that the underlying industries I don't think are going to change drastically in terms of we're we're in the banking vertical, right? And our customers, we we deliver onboarding in a compliant way, account opening, loan origination, portfolio monitoring. I think five years from now, people are still going to want to open accounts with as little friction as possible. And they're going to want to actually optimize their loan origination cycles and get them done as short a time as possible. The question is, how much of that will be agentic and how will we be able to measure those times with quality, right? Because these banks and credit unions are and, and IMBs are looking to keep up with their peers and use AI, but they're also wanting to best serve their customers without losing that community feel. And at, at, at the core of what our customers do is relationship banking. So if we do this right and we deploy the agents with the right human intervention, we should actually amplify the relationship with our customers. That's what I would hope you would see in five years. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I think when you start thinking about Agentic, Agentic can only go so far. Deterministic is also a way to look at this. So it's repeatable processes. Why do I need to change a process or allow you to actually do things that are outside the norm? For instance, I want to validate who you are before you actually start doing any type of consumer banking. That's repeatable. There's no reason to have Agentic. But when you get into the more complex, like I want to start talking and negotiating about how I can get a loan with you, that's going to be something that you want to have absolutely conversational using natural language processing. All right. I appreciate both of your insights. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Market Reporter at NASDAQ. Thank you.